Well, I know you wanted to schedule this uh, particular uh, live auction preview so folks, uh, especially on the West Coast where you are, have time to uh, fill up their glasses and uh, join us appropriately. Exactly. That's what it's for. The wine community serving the wine community. People loving people. It's powerful stuff. You know, while we're, uh, while we're letting folks file in, uh, and then we'll, we'll do a proper introduction here in a moment, sort of think of this is uh, the behind the scenes banter. Uh, I, I'm just curious, you know, I, I know your history. You've been doing this for a very long time. How is one fortunate enough to be able to be the life of the party at any party he attends? Uh, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is when you're a doctor, as soon as they find out you're a doctor, they start asking you about aches and pains. And it's a little bit like being in the wine business. So you're in the wine business. My nephew had a wedding. They served this white wine and it had a kangaroo on it. Do you know that wine? <laughs> um, but it's, it's been a rewarding career more often than not. I have absolutely no doubt about that. All right. Well, well folks are streaming in. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's begin this sort of formally. I'm, uh, I, Good evening to everybody who's joining us, or, or good morning. If you're watching us uh, on a tape delay, as it were, this will be broadcast on multiple platforms, but here we're doing it, of course, on Zoom. I don't know where you are, except that I'm very delighted that you could be with us at this happy hour for this very special event. It's a preview of the fine and rare wine signature auction that takes place Friday on Heritage Auctions website. Now, keep in mind, this is only our third live auction preview which lets Heritage, Auc Heritage Auctions into your home, since for the moment, you cannot come to ours. And for the foreseeable future, we'll be inviting our experts here to preview upcoming auctions, to discuss some notable lots, to field questions from our audience seated in this virtual preview space. My name is Robert Wolanski. I'm Heritage Auctions, a relatively new communications director. And for the next half hour or so, I will be fielding those questions from you via the Q&A feature below. Uh, or above, I'm actually not sure where it is uh, when you're uh, watching, I know where it is on my uh, dashboard. But let me just say this, you can send them to me anonymously and I will ask them of our expert joining us here today. That would be Frank Martel, Heritage Auctions Senior Director of Fine and Rare Wine. Now, uh, Frank and I were talking uh, beforehand and I will just say this, I have interviewed John, uh, I've interviewed John Cleese before, one of my favorite uh, comedy heroes, one of the comedy greats. But Frank is so great that uh, the Monty Python legend has actually interviewed him on the Food Network, no less. So, uh, Frank, uh, I hope this doesn't bother you. But before we begin this, I actually would like to uh, give folks, uh, since it is happy hour, since we are, uh, I hope, drinking a little bit, I kind of want to show folks a little bit of, uh, of that experience, if you don't mind. So here that is. It's the only room I could find in the house. But is it okay? I mean, it's what, are, what are the things you need for storage? You're looking for three things, basically. All right. You want the wines to be kept at a constant temperature below 60 degrees. Below 60 degrees. Below 60 okay. degrees. You'd like to avoid sunlight uh -huh. and vibration because these are things that influence the wines as they age. You want a bottle that's been left pretty much by itself. So, Frank, you were 12 at the time, which is incredible that you were, all, you were allowed <laughs> to, to, to drink and discuss yeah. wine then. What are we going to drink yeah, I wish. tonight? First of all, we're starting out with a soup, vegetable soup. I think it's mushroom and squash. Is it going to be a brothy soup or something a bit more creamy? Very yeah, creamy, definitely creamy. You could go with something a bit acidic that'll cut through the cream, but I'd prefer to probably match the cream with something thick like a Chardonnay. Okay. What are you? All right, Frank. Do you like? Uh, I'm going to uh, pause that if you don't mind. Great local wine. I'm sure you probably don't, as a matter of fact. I haven't. Uh, I haven't seen that much black hair on my head in a long time. <laughs> How long ago was that? Was what twenty years ago? I was oh three. 2003, I think. So 17 years ago. Yeah, it's been a minute. Obviously, before you joined Heritage and uh, you were, like I say, 12 years old at the time, that, that's fairly remarkable. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. That does sort of go back to what you were talking about a moment ago, which is that when you are a, a wine expert, uh, everyone wants your opinion about how it should be served, how cold or how warm it should be, um, and what you should drink. Uh, with whatever you are eating at that particular moment. John Cleese is clearly no exception. 
No, he was great. And you know, the thing that is really fascinating about him that really uh, was sort of in kind with a lot of the other collectors I've worked with is he's got this very inquisitive state of mind. And, and the thing that's great about the wine community is you're really never done learning. There's always a new vintage or a new label. And he was very interested in demystifying the process and sort of understanding that you're not born with wine knowledge. Inebriation is education and over a period of time of drinking and, and working through the process, that's how you become the wine guy. You're not born the wine guy. That is a, uh, a beautiful way of putting it. So obviously we're here to discuss the auction that takes place on, on Friday. But before we do that, I know you wanted to, to sort of touch on some, some higher level uh, discussion which is sure, especially sure. the state of the, the market these days. So sure, I'm gonna sure. let you take it away. This is certainly your discussion. So, so I'd like for you to talk about that first. Sure. Um, well, I think, I think it's been fascinating because one of the things that, that happens and it's happened every time there's been economic uh, turnover, whether it was um, the internet bubble bursting, 9-11, the financial crisis of 08, there's a certain degree of bounce because of course, people spend less money when they're frightened for their well-being. But um, the wine market has always been fairly well insulated. Um, and when, when all of this stuff started happening, and when COVID brought the stock market down to 18,000 and, and you sort of started wondering where things were going to go, wine prices really didn't change. And that's a first for my career. Um, so you start trying to figure out why and you look at bidding behavior and you look at a few things and uh, often the simplest answer is the most likely answer. And in this case, one of the things that we learned is that our platform online is so friendly that a lot of our people who maybe wouldn't have typically participated over the internet found that really appealing. Um, and the number of online participants we've had has skyrocketed. So with a captive audience and that many more people bidding, the, sta the sales kind of stayed where they were supposed to. Market value stayed where it was. What I want to talk about is what's really fascinating, the change in bitter, bitter behavior, which has been fairly radical. In the past, and by in the past, I mean 23 years of my career, um, lower value lots get sort of floater bids in the beginning, um, and nobody really wants to compete for that stuff. The higher value bids, very seldom get bidding activity in the early part of a, of, a, of a cycle. A lot of people don't want to bid until the end. Um, you know, you don't ever want to overpay for anything, but the trophy hunters, they're not watching the marketplace. They wait, they read the book, and then they pop in all their bids. What has changed is that now, across the entire wine world, we're talking wines south of $50, as well as wines up and above five, six, $10,000. Bidding is very, very hot out of the gate. Um, we're getting up to 75, 80% of the lots passing the reserve bid within 24 hours of opening the sale, which is pretty remarkable. Um, as it stands right now, there's only about 50 lots out of 600 that don't have bids on them. And they're very fine wines. There's not a reason for them to not have bids. It's just a matter of understanding that people are bidding on the most valuable things first but they're not bidding on them at the highest levels. They're not taking a $5,000 bottle and bidding 10,000. They're bidding about 10% below market. And when they get outbid, they're moving their bid to another lot. That one thing is brand new behavior. In the past, I'm bidding on this wine, I'll bid on it till I lose, and, and then I'm gonna stop. Whereas now I'm gonna bid on this, didn't get it, let me try something else. So there's two conclusions that I've drawn from there. The first is that a lot more people are buying for consumption than have been in the past. Um, typically, if you're filling out a collection, I don't mind paying 10, 12, 15% more because I'm filling in my collection. If you're bidding for an investment, if you're bidding for a variety of reasons um, that don't involve reducing the bottle to $0, then filling out your collection is more important than getting it for $10 off of wholesale. Whereas now people don't want to overspend on anything. So the, the synopsis of all this and to sort of draw it to a close is just that bidding is really strong. Prices are really healthy. Bidding behavior 
has changed fairly radically. And we're just at the very beginning of understanding how that's going to change bidding in the future. So to that end then, you say we're just at the beginning of starting to understand that, but certainly you've been in this long enough to sort of have an idea of why that is. When you talk about the fact that people are bidding for consumption more than for have, perhaps for collection, that seems to be a pretty good indicator that um, why, why they've come to this particular um, auction or this hobby uh, at a time of great stress and a time of great distress. Well, that's interesting, and that's very much the right way to put it, but one of the things that has been curious in the past, um, when people are under distress, when, when money becomes an issue, wine is never sold. And in the last few times, I was, I've, this is the first time I've gone through it at Heritage, but in my previous employers, the wine market took a hit when the stock market took a hit. There wasn't much we could do about it, but never did people sell their wine to come up on the shortfalls. It's easier to sell a piece of art, a third car, a vacation home, but wine remains an integral part of the, the everyday experience for people. And, and I think that we're seeing a lot of that right now. It is a comfort. And, and most amazingly, it's a social thing. And people are still finding ways to drink wine and have cocktail hour over Zoom and what have you when we can't take over a restaurant. So, you know, there really is a, an indomitable spirit about the wine community. And, and that is very much expressed in the way that they participate and buy. I will say this, the first week that we were all sort of sent home uh, was also the first week I bought a bottle of wine in several years. As a, uh, as a bourbon consumer, I uh, thought uh, I would take great solace in buying a, a nice bottle of red and a nice right. bottle of white and, and, and seeing how my evening would go from there. So I hope you bought it from us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just nod your head we did we did i did i wouldn't i would never buy anything other than from heritage um, um i do want to use this as an opportunity to segue into one more thing that i wanted to touch at that's sort of at a high level and by now i imagine anybody who's going to join us has um one of the things that this change in bitter behavior has precipitated for us has been a real move to drive people to the internet and what i mean by that is you know we produce catalogs, we have our own printing presses, and we take great pride in, in the book that we put together. But in the last three months, people who historically bid by, not by, by facts if such a thing exists anymore, emailing their bids in and what have you, has dropped to very, very, very few. Um, last year, and I did the numbers on this, last year, about 40% of our bids were received through normal traditional bidding methods, let's say. In the last auction, it was 9%. 9% of our people sent their bids in other than going to the website. And so, you know, evolving with this moment, we were sort of looking at it and this catalog has drawn a lot of attention. Um, we've, we haven't had many complaints at all, in fact, but the catalog, instead of being a compendium of everything in the sale with all the tasting notes and all the information that most people don't want, has been streamlined to a highlight reel, if you will, of only the lots that are over $1,000. This achieves a few things. The first thing is that the lesser value lots, they only get bid on over the internet anyway. Um, lower value lots are typically purchased for immediate consumption. Um, the trophy hunters want the book and the trophy hunters spend a lot more time looking through um, detailed notes and critical reviews. And so this is a step towards what's going to be very exciting for us in the fall where we launch Platinum Night, where we take all the just the very finest wines, not just expensive, but even among the expensive wines, taking only the highest value, and that will be our catalog. Um, but we really are trying to drive people to the website because as many people have learned, there's an instant gratification about knowing that your bids have gone in. And there's an instant gratification of knowing if you're winning the lot or if you've been outbid. It's a much more interactive experience and it's a lot more fun. So we are adapting with the times and COVID has given us the opportunity and the initiative to say, actually, this is where people are ready to move. So to that end, do you find that if people are in fact beginning to gravitate toward the, the lower price stuff, that that does make trophy hunters someday out of some of those folks. Uh, absolutely, um, I, but I want to clarify. I don't think that 
um, people are, are moving towards the lower end lots, I think what's happening is there are a lot more buyers. There's a lot more people drinking. And, you know, look, everybody who drinks wine is affluent to a certain degree. If you're drinking ten to $15,000 a year in wine, that's a lot of money. Um, and that could be one bottle or it could be 100 bottles. So, you know, introducing this idea that there are inexpensive wines that were once highly lauded and maybe forgotten or uh, that, that you keep in addition to your high level collectibles for good drinking. I call it mother-in-law wine. You know, mother-in-law comes over. She knows that I collect wine. I'm not opening Petrus for her and I'm not opening Latash for her, but I have to have something to pour for her that I don't mind drinking. So, so it's not to say that more people are drinking the lower value stuff. But historically, the audience for low value and high value has been A and B, different populations entirely. And that line is getting very blurry. That's what I meant to say. I thought when you said mother-in-law wine, that's the wine that you pull out when your mother-in-law is coming over because your mother-in-law is coming over. <laughs> right. Well, there's two mother-in-law bottles. There's the one you drink before she arrives <laughs> and then the one that you share with her. Then the bottle of bourbon is for after she leaves. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this auction that's coming up on Friday. Um, we certainly wanted to talk about some of the highlights. And uh, I know you wanted to discuss Bob David's. So let's do that, if you don't mind, because uh, we have some uh, some things to show here. So um, you wanted to talk about Bob David's. So let's do that, if, you, if, if you're if you good with that. Yep. Uh, you lost my video somehow. We did. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to come back to that. But if we don't... Um, okay. We'll just look at Bob David's for a moment. Yeah. So, so Bob, I want to tell a story about, I'd like to tell a story about Bob to begin with because it's just such a cool story um, and it explains a lot. Um, when Bob decided to open Sea Smoke, um, he sent a bunch of people out into the world to go find the best vineyards that they could find with the proviso that they wouldn't go to Burgundy. And for anybody who drinks Pinot Noir, that would seem counterintuitive. But his point was that the vineyards in Burgundy that he would want to own won't be for sale. Um, and he didn't want to take a second rate piece of land just for the fact that it was positioned in, in the Cote d'Or. So they went out and they found this bench in Santa Barbara, uh, in Lompoc in fact. But what's amazing is he hired the staff and he told them, this is the best and worst day of your life. You have unlimited resources. Your mission is to build the best vineyard that has the best plants to produce the best grapes. If you fail, it's because you weren't good enough. It's not because you didn't have the opportunity. And that uncompromising spirit really touches upon a lot of the things that he's done throughout his life. And, and I won't bore you with his bio, but when you look at the collection of Loire that we have in the sale, um, it's just about um, 70 lots. It's about 50% of the value of the sale. Um, he decided early on that Loire's wines were absolutely uncompromising. And he actually planned his travels from here to Hong Kong, through Europe to the UK, to try and overlap with when these wines were released. So he was going out into the world, buying them and bringing them home to his home in Reno. Now, the first time he consigned with me was back in 2004. And at that time, he was happy to sell to Bordeaux, okay, he sold some of the Burgundy, um, but he didn't want to let me touch any of the Loire, which I have to be honest, I quite understood. Um, over the period of time, you know, he's, we've stayed in touch. We sold a little bit here and there, but this time around, he was ready to sell the Loire. Now, the funny part about all of this is that his cellar is actually two stories underground. Um, the room has absolutely no ambient light. There are two small, um, barely light producing sconces when you walk in the door, but the room is black. And the first time that I went in to collect the inventory, I said, I can't work here. I can't get fill levels. I can't do this work because it's dark. Can we get some more light? He said, why the hell would I ever put light in my cellar? It damages the wine. The, the temperature never, ever budges. The humidity never budges. And the reason this is such an important collection is not just because it's so valuable, but because it has been handled in such an uncompromising fashion. There aren't better examples of these wines anywhere. Um, and for those who collect Loire and know her wines, 
you know, the wax that she used to use cracks and she overfills her bottle so there's signs of seepage. And if you don't know her wine, some of that can be very intimidating. But this collection is absolutely superlative. It's clean. It's absolutely the best example of its kind. Um, and it's very, very exciting to be able to sell it. Well, let's talk about some of the specific lots in this particular auction. I'm going to go in sure. and show some of the, uh, we have a, you were kind enough to go pull some of the photos today. So let's, 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 let's start here at the beginning, because I would like to, to, to sort of discuss some of what's going to be available and what makes these pieces so special. And sure. since we can't see you, no one wants to see me. <laughs> and look at bottles of wine. So here's the Screaming Eagle. Tell me sure. about this. So these are lots 140 and 141 out of the catalog. This is actually 92 and 93 Screaming Eagle. Um, these are the first two vintages and uh, they sort of immediately belong on the high rate, highlight reel simply because nobody had ever done anything like this before. Um, Gene Phillips vinified the 92, as it said, in trash cans. Um, you know, she hired, hired Heidi Barrett to help her make the wine. And in my mind, uh, I'm sure I'm not alone, the 92 and 93 are the finest wines that they've ever produced. You know, they began with a formula, they began with a blueprint, and um, they were true to that. And over the years, you know, you ramp up productivity, they, they added vines, the wines are still superlative, but these two vintages really stand apart. And fascinating enough, they didn't make a lot of it, and there's not a lot of it about. So your opportunity to buy 92, 93 Screaming Eagle is very, very fleeting. When they pop up, you need to snap them up. They're very, very cool wines, and they really are worth the price of admission. Frank, is it common for the first years uh, to be the best? Not necessarily. I, I don't think it's common for somebody to come out of the gate playing their best music either. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people uh, throughout the wine business buy a vineyard and, and continue working at it. You know, if you look at the Sea Smoke story and Bob David's, it's a little bit different because he had the means, the knowledge, uh, and the wherewithal to find a team that was going to be go, able to go from, from zero to 60 in no seconds. But, you know, this really was uh, a special blend of magic in the vineyard and, and in the winemaking. All right, so let's go to the uh, this one. I, I, and I'm going to say this. As a French student, I am still not going to pronounce any of the names today. Simply for the fact <laughs> that you, sir, are the expert. I'm just here to ask you questions. So this is the 78 Reserve de Celestin from Henri Bono. Now, I have to admit, first off, that I haven't had this wine. Um, I've had most of the other vintages, all of them going back to, to this vintage, and, and even I've had the 72 a couple times. But this is the rarest of the rare. Uh, he makes this wine very, very seldom. He makes it in very, very small quantities. And throughout the time that you look at this, um, they weren't really, uh, it took some time, I should say, for them to really capture imaginations and, and build up market appeal like they have. But this is the unicorn. This is the best vintage in, in the last 50 years in the Rhone. Um, and it's arguably the, one of the best wines every single time he decides to produce it. So finding something like this in this condition is pretty uncommon. So you've never tried it, therefore you, you would not mind uh, someone buying it for you. I'm working really hard to make sure that I know the person who buys this wine. And if I don't know who it is before it's bought, we're going to know each other afterwards. And we're going to get to be real pally. That is an excellent theory, sir. Um, I, let's talk about the, 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 this trio here. Sure. Uh, let's start with the wine on the far right. Um, it's sort of, for those of you who know me, I am a big time Burgundy lover. For those of you tuning in that don't know me, I'm a big time Burgundy lover. <laughs> um, and with all those things being true, Loire's wines are a little bit enigmatic to me. Um, I never, ever, ever fail to see quality. They want, they're built to just fantastic standards. She takes such care. She makes such small quantities. It's such rich, concentrated wine for what it is. Um, sometimes I fear that there's a little bit lost between her vineyards because it is such a concentrated style that she produces. Now, with all that said, 
this Mousini I have had, it's an extraordinary wine by itself, but she makes so little of it. I mean, hundreds of bottles. Um, I don't know how much I want that bottle so much as I don't like that I can't have it. Um, and prices on this have really gone through the roof. You know, this, the bidding on this wine at the moment is at $92.50, uh, which with pre premium works out to around $11,000. And that sounds really scary. Um, and it is a big number. But when you consider Romani Conti is producing 400, 450 cases, um, Latash makes a few thousand cases, and those wines are selling from the from the eight to twenty five thousand dollar range. This has all the quality. It's just as, if not more, scarce than anything out there, and that makes this something very worth owning. It's very very special wine. The problem is you only get one bottle, so when the hell do you open it? Um, on the other side, the two bottles on the left are 91 Riesborg. Loise Riesborg is legendary. Um, and her treatment of the 91 vintage, um, you know, where, where Ravani gave her 100 point scores all over the place, they really are extraordinary wines. Um, but I think the thing that I really love about them, and the reason they make the highlight reel over some of the 1990s and 96s and 99s that are, that are more lauded vintages, um, I like her in the really austere lean vintages, and not necessarily lean, but in the more um, uh, steely, um, reluctant vintages, if you will, in, in the reserved vintages. And these wines really are for me the best that she's made. So let's go. I, I, I love this bottle. I, do, I don't even want to know how much this is going to cost, but please tell me. So uh, this, there's a little controversy about this. I think most, most of our viewers will know, but those who don't, um, you know, Rudy Kurniawan, the notorious Rudy Kurniawan, who was busted for counterfeiting and thing. This is the only wine that Manfred Krankel has ever bottled privately. It was for Rudy and his friend, Matt. They bought a barrel. Um, it's exceedingly hard to find. And Rudy's partner in purchasing the bottle uh, in the barrel still owns a lot of it. Um, we sold a bottle of this, I want to say two years ago for around 16,000. Um, the bidding at the moment is at 9,000. Um, it's tough to know what to do with this one, you know, at 7,500 hammer, 92, 9,300 with buyer's premium. It really is a relative value, um, considering how rare it is and how much some of the other wines produced by Sine Quinon can can achieve but the last couple of times that we've offered it it had no bids it had no bids it had no bids and then it shot above the high estimate <laughs> so it's tough to know do you do you take a, a softball shot at this one and, and throw out a low low estimate bid which is 9500 um, and hope for the best or do you wait and play it by hand and, and hope to bring it down um, and strategically i don't think there's a right answer but it definitely is the most rare and the most coveted of sine qua non's wines. I find the backstory behind this as fascinating as what might be inside of it, by the way. Uh, you know, I had the wine shortly after it was bottled uh, with Rudy, funny enough. And it's, it's everything that sine qua non is supposed to be. It's this massively constituted, super elegant wine. It's very, very, very pretty. I, of course, haven't had it since it was born, but. <laughs> All right, so tell me about these two. So Soldera is uh, one, of the, one of the leading producers in Italy. It's probably the most expensive of the Brunello that are produced. What makes this really cool is that they're in magnums. Um, you don't see a lot of large format Soldera and finding it in magnum format, it's just a cool thing to have. Um, you figure they should be worth somewhere in the vicinity of 23, 2600 for the pair. And the bidding's only at seventeen hundred, so there's a there's a relative bargain to be had there, but um, but pulling out a, a magnum of soldera is a big deal. You know, when when you see seven fifties pulled out, that's kind of cool. But to put a magnum of soldera on the table is to make a statement. It's a very very cool lot. And when you pull out a magnum, social distancing is very much a thing of the distant past. <laughs> exactly. I'm, so. I'm, I want to know about these. You, you would send me these. I had read up on these, but uh, I'd leave it to you to, to tell me what makes these so interesting. So uh, the Isley Vineyard, as everybody 
tuning in probably is aware was purchased by the Araujo family and beginning with um, I believe the 91 vintage definitely by 92 it became one of the cult producers and it was one of the first real cults that came out of the box hot um, it was Araujo, Bryant, Colgan, Harlan and Screaming Eagle and it stayed in that company for a while till the late 80s uh, late 90s and it sort of didn't keep pace with some of the other cult producers and they made a little bit more wine, um, changed winemakers a little bit and, and the quality stayed quite high, but it wasn't what it was when it came out of the chute. Now that vineyard being one of the most important documented heralded vineyards in California's history, you look backwards before it was Araujo and before Araujo um, it was Phelps. And so there's an, a few Vintages, quite a few vintages, but for me, the 87 is the highest quality of all of them. Uh, after 87, there's an 89, there's a 91. I don't think I've ever seen a 1990. Um, so this is in the last three or four vintages produced, but it's the highest quality Isley that's been made. It's beautiful, perfect California Cabernet in the style that they used to make wine, which is really very elegant. What does, what does that mean, the style they used to make wine? What makes that... Cool. Uh, it's a great question. Historically, California made wines that were a bit more, I don't want to say French in personality because California can only make California wine, but they were restrained. They were balanced. They weren't uh, as low in acid or high in alcohol as what Napa Valley produces today. Stylistically, this is a bit more Elizabeth Taylor, whereas the modern winemaking is a little bit more Pamela Anderson, um, both of them in their prime, of course. That's not to make an age statement. I was going to say 1962, Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, it, exactly, exactly. Um, back in those days, the wines really were just a little bit more sophisticated and not, not more or less beautiful, but a little bit more elegant. Um, and, and for this Berkeley drinker, that's a very attractive proposition. Understood. This particular bottle uh, it was also uh, one you sent me that we were going to discuss, and I and I, I'm I think this is one of the few whites we actually have uh, on the uh, on the list yeah. here today. Th this wine is super 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 exciting. So uh, Lawa that we were describing before, she makes very small quantities of a number of wines, and she started bottling her domain wines, meaning from the vines that she owns herself. She began that process in 1988. And after a little while, she started buying up other little plots that she named Dovene. Now, I'm gonna ruin this for a few people by telling you my personal interaction with these wines began very, very early when we thought it was just going to be a second product for her that she didn't necessarily take the same care and attention to. And back then, I was drinking the Chevalier. Mind you, it only came up one or two bottles at a time. But I was drinking it for about $100. <laughs> Um, nobody really wanted it. Uh, her Creop Batard Mont Rocher you might have found for $70. You know, people just didn't recognize it. And suddenly, a few years ago, Dovenet became a thing, and people understood that it's still her winemaking, and it's still terrific vineyards, and it's still terrific biodynamic farming. So it really shot up through the roof. Now, what's cool about these is that this is the first vintage that she produced Chevalier Mont Rocher. Um, there was nothing before this. 93 is a burgundy lovers vintage for whites. They're still holding up, they're still beautiful. Um, they were largely overlooked, but especially out of a house that is as concentrated as her wines are. Um, it, it's a fascinating article and there are two bottles in a lot so you can drink one and keep one. Um, they are expensive to the degree that you're looking at probably seven to $9,000 for the pair, but the last time it sold was around 4,800. So, you know, the, the value is there. Um, and again, this is one of those things that buy it when you can, because you can't buy it next. There isn't another opportunity for this to sneak up and there's not another chance to bring it home. I think we, the, the, there's the two. Yeah, that's the same. Buy one, drink one. I mean, uh, keep one, drink one. Buy one, mail one to Frank. <laughs> you can give them your address at the end of this, Frank. We'll work. Let's talk about these because I, I look at this and I know that this is immediately something I would deeply, deeply enjoy and will probably never have the luxury of tasting. 
Uh, it's the lowest price of all of our featured lots in this podcast, in this broadcast. Um, Don Ruinart is a terrific house. Everybody knows that. There's, there's not a big surprise here. But old Don Ruinart, very, very few people have very uh, one of one of the she drank the seventy one with me next to the seventy one Don Ruinart. and I remember this so so clearly because it was it was an epiphany. Everything in her world stopped as she drank that Don Ruinart and realized, holy Christ, I didn't know that Shane can do this, and and I. Th- Thing that they produced through those 70 vintages, 71, 73, and especially the 76, they are absolutely stunning wines that can still be had at a relative bargain. Um, you know, this lot, the bidding is going to be at the low estimate of 1300. Um, consider what the you know releases from Don Marignan cost when you consider what new vintages of Sauron Cristal cost, 250 bottles of this. And it is really cool stuff. Well, I'm very excited that we got a chance to go through some of these. <clears throat> some folks do have some questions, uh, so I'm going to get them to you uh, before I let you go. Uh, in fact, we have uh, several questions. So, someone says wine is stored at a certain temperature before sale and before serving. How rigidly must temperature and other conditions? in between those two points be monitored? Could it get too warm and be salvaged before serving by moving into better conditions? And does that vary from grape to grape? I love this question. Um, what the, it's hard to say this without, well, I'm unwinding what I've said before, but possibly more important than the, the gross storage temperature is actually the transport temperature and the consumption temperature. Um, I love to, well, I hate to tell, but a great illustrative tor- story was a cellar that we had up in the Hollywood Hills, and it was deep inside the mountain, and the, the cooling unit was really impressive. The temperature never rose above 50, um, but it wasn't very well insulated, and the air conditioning was on full time. So what happened is, between winter and summer, it would never come up above you know, the a nice brown temperature, but maybe we're getting so, so cold. And the temperature bouncing from 40 to 60, 60 to 40 to 60 spoils the whole action. So yeah, paying attention to your transport and all of that stuff, it really does matter. Um, and, you know, if I'm going to be around with wine for a couple hours, I keep styro in my car and the styrofoam air will usually a, a soft pass it absolutely is worth taking care of these things because once we did 20 or 30 years to get to you, you don't want to ruin the life. Frank, we're, I'm losing you just a little bit. I, I know it's uh, your internet is uh, come and gone today, but uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get through these next few questions. And uh, just, just so you know, uh, okay. Is it better? what's that? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Someone asks, are there ways to prove or document the care that has been shown for a wine? So that's kind of along the questions that you were just asked. Beyond taking the owner's word for it, are there people who can actually evaluate that without opening the bottle? Um, yes and no. Um, what we're really looking for is a preponderance of evidence. You know, it, especially when you look at large format bottles, for example, signs of seepage aren't terribly uncommon. Um, when you look at wines that are 50, 60, 70 years old, you know, I was in a cellar once where it was literally a commercial freezer, a 2,000 square foot commercial freezer that somebody pulled out of a restaurant, used two helicopters to put in down two stories of ground, they built a square house on it. Temperature, but it was a 1950s commercial unit. It was sucking. Idea, the fills in that collection were horrific, but the wines tasted really good. So, what I've learned inordinately by or inordinately 
by bright, I mean like red wine loses color over time, whereas white wine gets darker with time. If it's wine that have enough color or if it's super bricked, we start with the color and we decide, okay, is this sellable or not? Um, but we work really hard on knowing where the wines come from before they arrive. And if it arrives with seepage and color problems, we'll reject it very, very quickly. Um, if anything is borderline, we have, it's built into the consignment agreement that we can taste two or three bottles to make sure that what we're selling is healthy. Um, but, you know, there's not anything, there's not a magic laser beam, there's not a, a, a Star Trek tricorder yet. A lot of this is about knowing who the seller is, asking them where they bought their wines, taking a look at receipts, and most importantly, knowing how it, the wine has been treated in their care. Excellent, sir. Thank you. Someone else asks that you hear people say they have wine that, quote, won't be drinkable for 10 years. Is that, is that something that is known when a vineyard is planted or is that determined after the wine is made and experts get to sample it? Maturity is sort of red area. Um, it, it's really personal. For me particularly, I like drinking wines when they're quite old. Um, so if we're talking about Burgundy, I drink village wines at sort of age five to seven. I don't start drinking Premier Cru wines until age 12, 13. I don't drink Grand Cru wines before 15, 18 years old. Um, and it's taken a lot, a lot of experience and a lot of hangovers to come to the conclusion that that's the sweet spot for me. And other people prefer younger drinking wines. You have to find that out for yourself. And I think that everybody goes through several epiphany moments. There's not one aha moment. You'll have them over and over again where somebody pours something for you that you know is not ready, but you get quality there. Um, and the best example I have of this, I was at Pichelin in New York. Uh, I remember I was with Paul Bowker, a good friend of mine from Christie's, and we drank 89 Cheval Blanc with 95 Araujo. And this was when 95 Araujo was just at its absolute most brilliant. I would say this was 1999, 2000 maybe. And we poured that with the 89 Cheval Blanc that was somehow better. It was still holding back. The Araujo had more fruit and more power and more, more everything. But I knew that the Cheval Blanc was gonna be better eventually. And I think it was probably 2005 or 2006 that I had a bottle that finally delivered on all that promise that I'd seen previously. Now, what's hard to describe and what everybody has to find for themselves is that tasting experience, because I don't know why I thought the 89 Cheval Blanc had more. I just thought it did. Um, and you get that with, with a lot of drinking. You got to drink wines all across their lives and you have to drink young wines and old wines. And if it really matters to you, um, over a period of time, you'll, you'll find that sweet spot for yourself. I feel like I have a lot of catching up to do on that subject, so I should drink a lot more. <laughs> uh, I'll ask this one last question, and then I'll let you go. I'm sure you have something you would like to open at this moment. Um, right. This is from somebody who's relatively new to wine collecting. Do different types of wines fare better at auction depending on the season? Grapes obviously have growing seasons, but as far as getting an elite value, is it better to buy Burgundy, for instance, at, some, at one time of the year, Bordeaux at another, and so forth? That's another terrific question. The answer is not what it used to be. In the old days, you had to buy Bordeaux uh, in the summer and winter months, and you wanted to sell it in September and March. Um, it was very, very consistent. But that was before the internet really proliferated wine auctions. That was before people spent a lot of uh, time and attention building these massive sellers. Nowadays, it's pretty homogenized. You know, you can assume that in the, in the May and June months, there's gonna be a slight surge in white wines. And you can assume that in September, October, there'll be a slight raise in form on the, uh, on the wines of port and some of the heavier reds. But for the most part, it's pretty normalized. Um, if, you're, if you're buying to consume, the beauty is that these wines are available all year round and you have to be opportunistic and you can look at every single sale and say, wow, that wine is undervalued today, so I'm gonna take a shot at it. Um, and you can sort of let the auction vehicle decide what you're gonna explore. Uh, on the flip side, most of what you're gonna to wanna to drink is available year round and you can go chasing it. Um, and, and it's always there for you. There's not as much uh, pressure 
to carry an inventory of thousands of bottles so that you've got everything at fingertips. Well, Frank, I have to say, this has been a tremendous pleasure. It's been a great education as well. I look forward to us doing this again. Uh, I know you have the Platinum coming up in the fall, so we'll do that. Uh, obviously, at 8 p.m. Central Time on Friday is when the signature floor session begins for this auction. It, it, it will take place uh, yeah. right here. So if you see it here, if folks have questions for you that they didn't get to ask here, what is the best way for them to contact you? Uh, my email address is always the best place to find me, and that's F R A N K M, Frank M, at H A dot com. Well, Frank, I've really appreciated this. This has been a tremendous education for me and for everybody else who's joined us. I'm sorry we lost your picture, uh, but uh, that said, and, and the worst part is they got stuck with me here for the last few minutes. So thank you for doing this and uh, we'll, we'll see you down the road and I look forward to, to sharing a bottle with you sometime when uh, we, we both travel a little bit more. For sure, thank you. Thank you everybody and I look forward to it. If anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, sir. All right, take, take care. care. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll do it next time. Bye. All right, bye-bye.